I have uh, the distinct pleasure now of uh, welcoming Zita Cobb. And Zita is not going to talk to you about uh, women's issues. She does not necessarily distinguish women's issues as ones that uh, grab her attention when she is uh, thinking about philanthropy. But she is somebody who has gone through what for all of us will be a truly fascinating journey of um, uh, figuring out what her passion was and how she was going to do that and give back. Zita is uh, a woman of strong opinions, uh, very smart, and I am in great fear of saying something that she's going to object to, and I know she'll tell me if she does. <laughs> So I, I'm just going to say a few words about Zita for those of you who have perhaps only read about her. Um, uh, if you Google Zita, you could sit for hours. You could settle right in for the day reading all the things that will come up. And they're wonderful, they're interesting, they're exciting, just as is Zita. Ask her for her bio and you get a very short cryptic paragraph. Um, so I thought I would just bring up a few of the facts that are in the, uh, the, the official bio. She was born and raised in, uh, on Fogo Island in Newfoundland, the sixth of seven children and the only girl. I think these are all very relevant things. I think <laughs> in the context, we get to understand something about you when we, we know those little things. She left Newfoundland to attend Carleton University at the age of 16. And after graduation, she began a career which led to her becoming a senior finance professional in the burgeoning high-tech industry. She made her fortune and retired at 43, then sailed around the world for four years, while at the same time developing her philanthropic strategy and her dreams and her philanthropic ideas and these were not small ones, these were big ones. So that's the um, official biography. Here's a different set of facts about Zita. She's one of the most fascinating women I've ever met. She's very, very smart and thinks big and bold. And when applied, that thinking leads to pretty powerful philanthropy. It's, a, it's guided by um, a strong intelligence, but informed by a, a great generosity of the heart. And Zita's been doing strategic philanthropy before that became a buzzword in our uh, world. Besides that, she's got a wicked sense of humor. So you may learn all these things for yourself now. Zita, can I welcome you? Yeah, Barb's right. I mean, I, I never, I don't think I've ever been to an event that had as many women. In including our kitchen table, which was all boys. And I don't think I realize even now that I'm a girl as distinct from a boy. <laughs> it's it, because that's the culture I came from. And I think it's so much about the culture you come from. And I think, uh, I mean, and philanthropy is, a, that's a big word. And uh, I think it's, a, for me, has been about destiny. I, I think these things choose us. Certainly, everything I've ever done in my life chose me. And I think it's a Buddhist expression, and I'm not Buddhist, but it's so beautiful. It says you just follow the path that wants to emerge. And I think that's all I've ever done. And um, I sometimes feel like I'm in a Joni Mitchell song. Actually, quite often I feel like I'm in a Joni Mitchell song. And uh, one of the lines in a Joni Mitchell song is, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And with the work that I'm doing now is all about that. And another one of her great lines is, I've looked at life from both sides now. And so I'm going to tell you about, uh, well, you're going to hear a lot about Fogo Island. So if, if you want to leave, this is now the time because we're going to get deep into it. Uh, and, I, and, you know, the, uh, Fogo Island is nothing more than a community. And it could be any community. It just happens to be this one because that happens to be where I'm from. And I think if I go through what we're doing, and, uh, you'll get a sense of... Um, well, the, I think the how will come out. We'll just, we'll just follow the path that wants to emerge. <laughs> oh, and it works. So the, the images are of Fogo Island, and we were just discussing whether you can actually see them with the lights all on. But it's, it's very beautiful. I wouldn't want you to miss anything. 
And I put this out there as a question, whether it's a requiem or an anthem. I think we live in, in a time that rural communities around the world and in Canada are disintegrating around us in the race to urbanization. And I don't think we know, as Joni Mitchell said, what we've got till it's gone. And, um, you know, a requiem and an anthem are both nostalgic. One is melancholic and the other is positive. And I actually don't know the answer to what's going to happen on Fogo Island yet. That time will tell. But it, I think it falls to me, fell to me and people like me to be part of trying to make it an anthem and not a requiem. So, and there it is, it's a, it's a very mystical, magical place for absolutely certain. And uh, it's got a way of knowing that's actually in the rocks and, and it comes out in the people. I think that uh, people are formed by geography. And I, mean, I grew up here, so you know, I, I, I feel like I came out of these rocks. And I think as a country, actually, not to be very political about it, but just for a moment. <laughs> Canada is essentially a country of rural places. And when you think, I mean, my career was in business, and when you think about it, it uh, at the broadest level, we are people who have extracted the Im immense natural resources we have spread around the country, whether they're agricultural resources in Saskatchewan or trees in BC, or we didn't get the trees in Newfoundland, but we got some other things, we got fish. And, and, and in the doing of that, we needed and have and still have great business minds and great technology that's generally parked in city places. And if you really want to set me off, get me, ask me about, you know, do people have a right to live in rural places? And I say it's not about rights. It's about the fact that if we don't have people living in rural places, we are going to become complete idiots as a nation. Never mind the fact we probably won't be able to feed ourselves after not that long. And, you know, and it's a funny kind of a thing, and you'll hear this about Newfoundland in particular, and I'm sure if there's someone here from Saskatchewan or from BC, they tell a similar story. You know, we extract everything, the people who live in these rural places who have this really close, intimate sort of ecological knowledge that comes from living tangled up with the natural world in a way that life and death, you know, it all depends on that. When all the resources are gone, you know, to look at them as urban people and say, what's the matter with you people? Can't you get a job? You know, why don't you move to Gander and work at McDonald's? <laughs> I think that's uh, a, a little bit of what's happened. And uh, I, I do think we probably have another 10 years before what, what is the state of rural Canada. So there's my political thing. We'll move on to talking about Fogo Island. So it is one of the four corners of the flat earth. So says the Flat Earth Society, which is a really wonderful piece of lunacy and can give you a lot to think about. And uh, anyway, there it is. I don't think my little clicker thing will be... Oh, look, it does. We're up in the ceiling. Look, it works. We're way up there. We're, but really, that's only 49 degrees. What is interesting about that is we're in the Labrador Current, so every year, half of Greenland breaks off and comes down on top of us. And that sounds like a bad thing, but it's a really, really good thing, because that's where, why we have all the fish. And we are also seal hunting people. At least we were until not very long ago. Um, but in any event, in terms of a culture, I mean, Newfoundland joined Canada in 1949, but Fogo Island is one of Canada's oldest settlements. And as someone said to me recently, it's like, okay, well, you people are the newcomers that have always been here. And, you know, when I go away, when I leave the island to go up to Canada, people still say, so you're going up to Canada? <laughs> it's like, yeah. And actually, my next door neighbor, whose name is Amos, always says, and when you're up there, can you find out why I can only get 49 cents for a pound of fresh wild cod pulled out of the ocean? And I saw in the New York Times, now where he gets the New York Times is a whole other story, <laughs> that people are paying $2,000 for a handbag. <laughs> so anyway, uh, he's waiting for an answer. I'm, I'm working on finding an answer, yeah. And so there it is off the northeast coast of Newfoundland. And uh, so I was born there. Everything that uh, we are as a people came from this fish and, uh, and no better teacher and no better thing to base your life on than a fish because it, it really contains everything. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the fish, but I mean, it informs the, the people, it informs the stories, it informs our language, it informs our architecture, everything. I mean, and if you can imagine what it's like, I mean, the North Atlantic is a pretty savage place. To make a living in such a place is a quite a remarkable thing. And what's interesting about that is not, um, 
it, it's not the buildings or it's not uh, the boats, it's the knowledge that's in those things that, that I think is in, in great peril and that's what I'm very passionate about and our projects have been about that. And um, it's a place that has seven seasons at least. I was just talking to Bibi and Jillian saying, because we, you know, we built an inn, which you'll see in a minute. I'm actually thinking about closing down in July and August, because who want to go to Newfoundland in July and August? It's boring, when we have all these other really dynamic seasons to choose from. And so, um, and I'm going to talk about economics soon, but I want to say, having grown up in this community, I think a community is uh, to me, a definition of a community, and it's not mine, it comes from a fellow named Charles Eisenstein who wrote a book recently, well, maybe a year or two ago, called Sacred Economics, and I highly recommend the book. He says, uh, really, the definition of a community is when people truly depend on each other. It's not, you don't, it's not, you don't choose it, and you, don't, you can't opt out <laughs> because you depend on each other. And, and that truly the definition of community is it's a web of gifts. And so I'm 55 years old. I really grew up in a cashless society. And you really depended on other people. And so much of what you needed for your every day, I got from you, or I got from you, and you got from me. And you were always understood that if you don't participate in that web of gifts, pretty soon you're going to be hungry. And so I always, I always feel uncomfortable when people sort of talk about you know, this decision to give. I don't understand it. Of course you give. Otherwise, you're just kind of opting out of society altogether. And another concept that this book, Sacred Economics, talks about, and I'll talk about it next, I might forget, because it's so important. We have become so over-focused on money. I mean, remember, money hasn't actually been around all that long. And, and it has two functions. One function, which is where it was invented, I guess, is to facilitate trade. I need a turnip and I can't find anyone nearby who needs a turn up and instead, you know, but maybe if I had some cash, I could trade you and you could trade with someone else and I'd eventually get a turn up. What it also became, and this is the bad side of money, it became something that people hoarded. I mean, you don't hoard turnips, right? Because what are you going to do with too many turnips? But you will, we turns out, we humans hoard money. And that aspect of money, which is not sacred, has been, I think, a part of the destruction of other forms of capital that are actually very sacred. And I, I, I better stop there because I'll be back in Joni Mitchell again if, I, if I'm not careful. And so we, there, there you go, there, see, I was telling Bibi, you gotta come in the spring, this is to pack ice that comes from Greenland. That's not our ice, it comes from Greenland. You wake up in the morning and there's nothing in the harbor. And by afternoon, the winds change, all this ice comes in. It's amazing, and it undulates with the tide. It's a, it's a really remarkable thing, and the seals come with it. And then after the pack ice come the icebergs. And when people talk about, you know, are things warming up and what's happening with the, with the polar ice cap, we see it. I mean, we know exactly because it has affected what's coming. So we've uh, created some buildings, as Barb said, there's been a huge amount of press about the project, which we really don't understand the interest so much, but I think it's because we've chosen uh, la a language of design to speak, which really gets people's attention. So the young architect who uh, designed the inn and designed the studios, when he came to start the project, he's a Newfoundlander, uh, educated at McGill. His practice is in Bergen, Norway. His design brief was really short. It was, get over yourself, let's start with that. Your job is to find a way to express in contemporary architecture what we have, as a people have lived for the last 400 years clinging to this rock. And this particular building, he spent a very long time with it. And, and I think you see it in his work. And so these are the people of, of folk, well, he's actually from Change Islands. So this man's a boat builder and a furniture builder and his father-in-law said, very famously, locally, any man can build a book, can build house. Of course, most urban men kind of go, really? Like, maybe, maybe not. But not any man can build a boat. And if you can build a boat, you can build anything. And, and that really inspired me when we started the project about, that really affected the journey we took about what we thought we could or, or could not do. Anyway, to build a boat, you have to start with wood, of course and you have to know how to go into woods, and you have to, have to know which tree to get, and you have to get the tree that grows underground and comes up. I mean, this is all knowledge that without these people, 
maybe we'd never be able to build boats. And when we started the project eight years ago, my, bro my younger brother said, do you realize we are eight funerals away from never being able to build a wooden boat on Fogo Island ever again? Because with the collapse of the cod fishery, these little punts weren't needed. And you know, that sort of became a tagline, like eight funerals away. And so we started the program at the high school uh, for boat building and some of the master builders went in with the kids to start building punts. So we're, not, we're no longer eight funerals away. But last year, I guess a picture comes up of one of our builders died on Christmas Day. So we stopped, try to stop saying that now because that eight funerals is, is really very, very real. But anyway, he's one of the, the great builders. That's, that's the kind of punts. No steaming is used in making these. They just cut the wood. They know how to choose the wood and how to cut the wood to get the shape they want. And we have hot tubs at the inn, which uh, we were having leaking problems with the hot tubs, and we just can't figure out, it made of wood. And so anyway, we said, well, let's get the boat builders in here. This is ridiculous. I mean, it's just wood. Anyway, that same man came and he said, listen, I only know how to keep the water out. Keeping the water in is a whole different matter. <laughs> that's, a, that's a different kind of knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> and so anyway, there he is. He, he, we, have a, we have a race, which we started in order to uh, give new use to these punts. And he always places one, two, or three. We build houses. There you go. Any man could build a house. And that's the man who died on Christmas Day last year, one of the best builders we had. I love this photograph. It's old. It's actually from Labrador. But you get a sense of fish as members of the family and just how intimate the relationship is uh, between people and fish. This is how we fished for 400 years. So my father was an inshore fisherman which meant that he never really went out more than five miles from shore. Brilliant coastal navigators. And as Churchill said, the best small boatmen in the world are Newfoundlanders. And this was a perfectly sustainable fishery. I mean, nobody was rich and we didn't have a lot of money. Um, in fact, any. Um, but it sort of didn't matter. And then this happened. It took 30 years from the first one of these being built to bringing the cod to the brink of extinction. 30 years, that's it. So we were, I was 10 years old when the first collapse, well you see the landings, like what great, I mean I'm sure somewhere in a, in a corporation somewhere, someone probably put up a chart like this to show their bosses, look how many cod we're catching, we're doing really well. And then of course what goes along with that is, you know the cod did everything they could to, to, they started to uh, reproduce earlier, but I mean, it was just too much pressure on the population. And so the inshore fishery collapsed in the late 60s when I was 10 years old. So my father was really at the end of his career then. Uh, the year before uh, he, he gave up, and remember he's seventh generation Fogo Islander, when he went to uh, sell his fish to the merchant, the grade he got for his fish was the lowest grade. It was called so-called West, West Indy grade. And my father couldn't read and write, because reading and writing, that wasn't a big, big necessity. And, and so we had no information about why this had happened. And he kept saying to the merchant, like, it's the same fish that, you know, same fish I have sold you for, you know, 50 years. What changed? And, and there was no answer. And so that question actually informed me, uh, informed what I chose to study. Anyway, my father burned his boat and gave up on the fishery. And, um, of course, that affects that affects you. And many families around the coast of Newfoundland, Newfoundland had something like 800 little communities, all clinging to a rock, with no running water, no health care, none of the things we take as, as necessary things. Uh, and Fogo Island was one of those. And so the then Premier, Joey Smallwood, had a resettlement program, which, you know, you talk about strong opinions. I mean, we come from our province of strong opinions, but, um, I don't know that I would have been any better than him to find a solution to what to do when all of a sudden, in addition to all those other things we don't have, now there's no fish. What do you do? So he offered families a very small amount of money to leave. And he didn't have to offer the money. They had to leave. What were they going to do? Now, Fogo Islanders did not leave. And that was a remarkable story. This is actually not a sad story. We're getting to the happy part here in a minute. But, uh, but you know, there's a beautiful Newfoundland song uh, called The Outport People, and it's about resettlement. And the line in it just is so fitting, not just to Newfoundlanders, I think to people, uprooted people everywhere. And the line is, they moved without leaving and never arrived. And so I think this kind of 
separation of people from the natural, from home, is a really terrible thing. Anyway, so th these scenes were common. And this was my father said, he, he always said, you just better remember, it wasn't the fish that let us down. And so the question for me, well, well then what did let us down? I mean, how did this happen? And so um, I went away uh, to university, I went to Carleton, and, um, and I arrived here when I was 16 years old uh, in 1975. And I mean, I couldn't get over the fact you could just flick a switch and lights would come on and then they go back off. It was really very exciting. And uh, I decided to study business because I wanted to understand what the heck had happened. And um, when I was working, there's a cauliflower up here for a reason, so I, I studied business and I started to work and then I started to travel. And I started to realize, wow, the whole world is like little Fogel Islands. And there are so many of them and they're so beautiful. I mean, whether you're, I spent quite a lot of time on the African continent and and I, to me, being in a, in a rural community in the middle of Rwanda is not a whole lot different than being on Fogo Island. The weather is a bit different, but pretty much the same issues. And I started to realize, wow, there's like a, all of this is like a floret. Fogo Island is a little floret. And, you know, I just came back from Namibia, and we're in this tiny little community. That's another floret. And all these little florets. And then you have the connective tissue, the stem that holds it all together. And the connective tissue, that's business and technology. And when the connective tissue becomes too self-serving, the little florets die. So, so what? You know, we lose Fogo Island, we lose Esteban, Saskatchewan, or you know, whatever, name any community, you lose them. How many do we have to lose before we realize maybe there's a problem with the connective tissue? You know, maybe it's become too self-serving. And I think when you think about our business systems, None of our business systems were developed at a time that we had the awareness even of the sacred capital, of, what, of, of ecological capital, of, of cultural capital. So of course the connective tissue has to change. And I'm actually very optimistic that it is changing because I, I know the generation behind me know this and it is changing. But we need to be really careful how many florets, how many are we willing to leave. I, one of my baby brother lives at Young and Eglinton, and I keep telling him, Fogo Island, he's very involved in the project. I'm just trying to get him to move home. But I keep saying, you know, whatever happens on Fogo Island, it's coming to Young and Eglinton too, eventually. It's just a question of time. I mean, little communities, especially islands, are little sustainability laboratories. And, you know, if we don't take the opportunity to learn at the small scale, somebody was on the panel was talking about little projects that tell you a lot. We learn a lot in small places and, and from small, small projects. So, I mean, in a way, Fogo Island is, is a 400-year-old experiment, you know, whether people can live there. Anyway, I think about cauliflowers a lot. Um, yeah, and, and so it, when I made the turn to go home, and I don't, I mean, I really don't feel like I woke up one morning and decided. I, again, I feel like I just followed the path. If, if no one, if anyone's going to do anything on Fogo Island to try to be helpful, then if not me, then should it be you or you or you? I mean, I mean, I, mean, I could try and convince you, Barb, to come and help on Fogo Island, but, but, and you should come and help on Fogo Island because we need help. But, but I mean, of course it was, it was up to us. And uh, so we came home and I think um, used to work for a man named Joseph Strauss who used to have this great expression, he used to say, the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. <laughs> to which we'd all sort of think, well, what is the most important thing? He said, well, if you don't know what the most important thing is, you shouldn't leave the house in the morning because you're going to do more damage than you're going to do good. And so I, I, it, that has stayed with me. And, and of course, I think it's obvious from the things I've said that for me, the most important things, and I know that's two, but I count them as one because I think you can't separate them. Nature and culture are the two most important things. And of course, business and technology are the two really wonderful tools that should serve nature and culture. So it's all really good. We just, at the moment, in this modernity we're in, we have it exactly the wrong way around. And so anyway, my brothers and I decided to we would start a charitable foundation as a, a beginning and, uh, and then to try and figure out what to do. We did have a very brief moment of thinking, well, lots of other places put up water slides. Maybe that'll help. <laughs> and anyway, then we decided well, that, that no, folk wanderers can't swim. We'd probably all drown. So that wouldn't be a good idea. And so we decided to work with, I'm just going to go through the things that, that really uh, 
drove our decisions. Place itself has intrinsic value. And that, we have such a gift of place on Fogo Island. So that was the most important thing. We have ways of knowing that are specific and powerful that have emerged from that place. So we need to build on that. I came out of the business world and I don't think someone said, you know, charity is not, I was, you said charity is just not a word that anybody, who wants to be the recipient of charity? I certainly don't. And I, and I'm calling it philanthropy, well, it makes it a bit more confusing perhaps, but it's still the same thing. But the other thing is, eventually the money's going to run out. I mean, even Bill Gates' money is going to run out. Mine's going to run out a whole lot sooner than his. And so the question is, how can we use philanthropic funds in business-minded ways to build the business model into the fabric of the thing that you're doing? Now, the structure in Canada certainly doesn't make that obvious how you do that, but it can be done that charities can set up business trusts and that's what we've done. So for me it had to be about finding the ends, using philanthropic funds and, and we got, had a partnership with governments, both uh, federal and provincial in the beginning of the project that were really helpful. But that to me is the nature of social, of social entrepreneurship or social enterprise, but it has to be a business that serves social ends. And so there you go. I mean, these. Yeah, I've been, I don't know how long I've been knocking about in the business world, maybe 30 years or maybe more. Um, I think the two worlds have come a lot closer together and have learned from each other. And I like to think that maybe one day these, there will just be one sector and it'll just be organizations. And one of the ways we'll compete with each other is over how much do you put in your own private pocket and how much do you set free in the world? Like, why not? Like, that, I think that, that can work. A few laws have to change a little bit here and there, but nothing that we can't do. And maybe I'll see it in my lifetime. So this is a, I'm going to blame Diane for this slide because it's one of hers. Very confusing, but what, the point I want to show here in terms of our projects is, you know, it's meant to be to create a cycle of where capital is invested and used and flows and stays within the system. That, that's the idea of it. We have invested really heavily in art, uh, and, and the reason is not because I wake up in the morning and think, oh my God, I must save the starving artist, but because art is a way of knowing. I mean, as rural people, we have a way of knowing that comes from the natural world, that comes from an original source. There's so much stuff in the world that masquerades as knowledge or masquerades as wisdom and is not even knowledge. More than ever now, we need our artists because they know stuff that we don't know. And they see the world that's underneath the world. And, um, well, you'll see what, what we've done, but we created a residency program. And then the other thing we came to realize fairly early on is somewhere in the last two or three hundred years, a profession has emerged which is called design. And before that, the designer and artisan were one. But once that cell divided, immediately rural artisans were disadvantaged because they didn't have that professional design that you need to participate in the world of commerce. And so I'm sure we've all had the experience of going on a vacation to some rural place and you buy something because you want to help the local people and you get home and you look at it in your closet and go, oh my God, what was I thinking? I can't wear that here, you know, as an example, because it doesn't have that element of design. And so we made the decision to invite designers to come. Why can't a rural place benefit from great professional design? And I actually think that that's part of the reason the projects have gotten so much publicity, because that's a language. It's a tool. It's just another tool. And so, of course, we want it. This is, actually came from Farley Mowat. Farley Mowat is a writer who is not well loved in Newfoundland, generally. Uh, but um, his wife is very loved. She wrote a beautiful book called Outport People. But Farley Mowat said, if, if Outport Newfoundland is going to survive, they have to get really good at finding new ways with old things. And so we set out to try and find new ways with old things. And of course, it may have been okay in 1968, when I was 10, to be isolated. I mean, once the ferry didn't run in the winter, we were cut off for six months from the mainland, and perfectly happily so, unless you had a toothache, that was wrong. But now it's not an option. I mean, it's not, we can't debate globalization. Of course, the world's a globalized place. The question is how? And can we be globalized in a way 
that you have a whole bunch of interconnected little florets, so little communities that have some amount of self-determination around their own lives and that are connected through this wonderful web of technology and business we have. Like, does every business relationship have to go in the front door of a Walmart and out the back door of a Walmart? I hope not. I don't think so. And so I think this idea of how do we weave ourselves together in a new kind of, of world. That's not a big idea, Barb. That's just a little idea. <laughs> and so I'm not going to go through this quickly because I think, I'm sure you all know this, but when people think about capital, they usually start thinking about money, and that's, of course, obviously important, but the least sacred of all the forms of capital. And for the people who work in, in, in the gift, in the giving and in, in gifting in their lives, uh, it's, it's your time and your energy that matters the absolute most. Um, so that means social capital, human capital, cultural capital, natural capital, physical capital, and then last, economic capital. Now, I should put it in there because this Eisenstein fellow says there's another kind of a capital called spiritual capital. That's really interesting to think about. And so uh, this is the UN thing, you know, there are these three, three balls, and everybody plays with these balls in different ways, and how, do, how does economy, environment, and society fit together? And this is typically, since the Industrial Revolution, how we have operated where society and environment are wholly owned subsidiaries of the economy. And there's a, I can never get through a presentation without using this word sustainability. It's so overused that it's been diluted and polluted and, and has almost lost its meaning. But I mean, everybody knows, this, you can't keep at that. I mean, the fish will be all gone, the trees will be cut down. I mean, we have enough examples of all of that. So this is where we need to get to. Of course, nature has to be the most important thing. And of course, we have to respect the people and the cultures that emerge from their relationship with nature. And we just need to find economic models that are supportive of that. Simple. I'm sure we can do it. And so these are some of these, uh, these are the artist um, studios that we built. They're just made of wood. They're just little wooden buildings. They're quite small. But I mean, you get a sense of the power of design. And we think that they're all off the grid, so when, before the artists actually arrive at their workspace, they have to spend time outside. And sometimes it's windy, and sometimes it's cold, but that's a part of being, getting ready to go to work. And uh, this is the tallest one. There, this is a lovely, I always think this is, um, that will be spring storm, a good time to come. I, this rhythm of opposites, I, I think, I want to talk about sustainability a little bit. I, I always think that, you know, you're born and you die. And everything in between is an active act of balancing. And everything is wound up with its opposite. And that is the whole trick of life. It's the, and I think it's the whole trick of business. How much is enough and not too much. And that means that it's rarely really easy. And if it's easy, we're probably doing something wrong because we're not pushing hard enough. This is the only studio not on the ocean. This one, Apple used it in the launch of their iPhone 5. So if you see the little video, there it is. And if we got any lawyers in the room that can figure out how to get Apple to, <laughs> to pay us some money or you know, give us some iPhones for free <laughs> for having used it. But you know, we're, we're hugely flattered by that. That's a little 300 square foot building. That's all it is, made of wood, as they all are. So there you go. Did Todd Saunders, the architect, come up with anything? As, as one old fellow at home said, he just copied stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I think he copied well. And the caribou that live on the island don't seem to mind the building, so that's a good sign. And so then we get to the business of the inn, which has been a, a very uh, powerful and tricky journey. I mean, here's a, we started off with a, with a community meeting, a very philosophical meeting in which a woman stood up, because Newfoundlanders are renowned for their hospitality. And, and, and it's embodied. It's not layered on top. It's not taught. It just, and I think that comes from being on a little island. You never know, you know who's going to wash up in the harbor tomorrow that needs help. And a woman named Phyllis Call stood up and she said, are you sure about this? She says, because I'm not so sure you can sell hospitality. Like, would it still be hospitality? Right, big question. <laughs> anyway, that question lives with us, but it... Um, and it's good to live in the questions. But we've been uh, hugely helped by this community that understands hospitality. And I think, um, I think that's an industry that could use a little shaking up to. Um, 
I think everybody knows and feels this, that we are suffering from a plague of sameness. So when we set out to build the inn, we want it to build it from, from the ground up and from the hearts out, and not to copy something that had been done somewhere else. I mean, it's heartbreaking to go to city after city after city, especially on the outskirts. You cannot tell where you are. There are communities in Newfoundland that you just weep for how beautiful they were and how those that you mean built heritage contains our intellectual heritage, how that's been flattened. And the world just keeps getting flattened. And it doesn't have to be. We just need a little bit of a little acts of resistance every day. And this building, in a way, is an act of resistance to flattening. And uh, and it has to stand up to a Newfoundland snowstorm. Now, that's a time to be there. <laughs> now, when we realized, uh, we didn't have a big plan all along. As I said, we kept following the path that wants to emerge. When we realized we needed, if you're going to have an inn, you're going to need beds and chairs and quilts and tables and all of that, we realized, wow, this is a great opportunity to do this here. Why don't we create uh, a new kind of economy out of making these things and this is where these young designers came in. There, there they all are. Actually, that guy, there, uh, there. that's Todd Saunders. <laughs> and uh, so we invited all these young designers to spend time in residence with us. And this was a very typical meeting. And uh, these, this was the women who run the uh, Art Artisans Guild. I mean, it's an anarchy of color at every turn. And, uh, and this is what resulted from that collaboration. And they're simple pieces. They're informed by boat building, and they're all made locally. That, that piece, we, I think of it as an adult crib, because once you get into that, you don't want to come out. It's a reading chair. And you know, I'll give you a sense of flattening. We decided we wanted to be able to offer our guests four simple things that the cavemen had. Fresh air, just the ability to open a window. I mean, you didn't come to the edge of the world to not open the window. To have natural materials to touch. Just simple. The, and the only place we failed there was in technology, because there are no wooden phones. We're thinking about inventing one, but there, that's where it, ha, it needs to be plastic. A warm hearth to put a wood-burning fireplace in a guest room. I mean, a simple thing. We all, I mean, my house, every house on Fogo Island has a wood-burning stove. And, and then, of course, these warm hearths around which to gather. You have no idea how hard that is when you come up against the National Building Code because the building code is all set for what's easy, it's a two by four, you put it together in the same old way, and that's how you get the plague of sameness. So anyway, that, that was a really epic journey, and of course everything is, is handmade, and when somebody makes something by hand, you feel it. Even the wallpaper we designed for the inn. And of course, you see this, this beautiful little table, it can be a table or a stool. One leg is made with the off cut of the other. This is the sort of built-in idea of recycling that exists in the community. And this young designer made a table that's just based on that. And this is, these are the, the famous leaking hot tubs <laughs> that the boat builders can't figure out how to keep the water in. We're just not good at that. And uh, that's the dining room. And it looks, it looks like you're on the prow of a big ship. And of course, when you're figuring out what to put in the dining room, we have everything. I mean, you wait till the 15th of September, Fogo Island bursts into 16 kinds of edible berries. We have the North Atlantic with every fish you can imagine, some that Newfoundlanders won't eat, but it's an amazing abundance. And so we also have a business fund. We started that very early little micro-lending fund. We modeled it exactly after the Grameen Bank. And the first application we got was from this man who has this big garden to put in a greenhouse. He said, because the chef says he wants arugula. And he says, I don't know what that is, but he says he's going to buy it, so I'm going to grow it. <laughs> then he tried, actually, his, it was Freeman. He said, I tried cooking it. It doesn't hold up very good. <laughs> and so this is the kind of stuff that's come out of the dining room there. This is all local. I mean, we import, obviously, coffee and olive oil and chocolate because life's not possible without those things. But, um, and then we just, I was just saying, we found out we are on the top restaurants from en route in Canada. We came number three in the country. And I think the only rural one on the list. And, and we won this Global Vision Award from Travel and Leisure Magazine. And the point of that is, good things can happen in small places. And that innovation lives in that little place. How much innovation 
is out there in this country and every other country. It's on, little, on hiding under little rocks. Like we 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 just not seen it. It's in front of us. I mean, and the answers are out there. And it's like I was talking about coming back from Namibia. I've never been in a place where politicians stand up and make such brilliant speeches, have made such brilliant moves to protect ecology and culture. And it's like, who knew? It's over in Namibia. So I actually think sometimes the answers start in the periphery and come back in. So and don't overlook them. This was, uh, of all the things that have been written, this is the thing that means the most to me, that it's an act of human culture. And it is. The project is an act of human culture. And, I mean, I grew, I grew up feral, and I think for kids that can grow up feral, that's a great gift. And, and there are really good signs of codfish are coming back. The moratorium came in 92, and so what happened on Fogo Island, actually, is the reason they didn't leave, I didn't tell the story because it's not too long a story and we're already late, is um, the National Film Board came to Fogo Island in 1968 with Memorial University, and this is where I got this idea at 10 that, wow, the answer is in art. They made 27 films on Fogo Island that helped Fogo Islanders see themselves totally differently. Brought us together in a way that we formed a cooperative that, I mean, I was 10, I wasn't part of it, but my dad was. Um, and that cooperative owns the fish plants on Fogo Island today. And so I think for these sacred resources, we need to be really careful about the business models we allow to operate in communities. Because I'm quite sure that if the fish plants on Fogo Island were owned by a distant capitalist, they wouldn't be open today because they're not as efficient as the bigger plants somewhere else. And so they tend to optimize for return on capital, near-term return on capital, and not take the long view to community. So I'm a big fan of co-ops, and social entrepreneurship is kind of a form of co-op. I mean, in a way, they're not, I mean, obviously they're not perfect. We think about the co-op as an organized way to fight with each other, but, we, but we're fighting with each other, you know, that, and that's a good thing. There was a beautiful, I don't know who the columnist was in the Globe and Mail a few days ago, and uh, she said something like, it's not a revolution we need, it's more conversation we need. And I, re I really very much agree with that. And so there you go, that these, we have a women's division in the race. See, maybe I do have a women's element in me somewhere. <laughs> and uh, actually, the outport women and men went to St. John's because the, the townies, as we call them, challenged us to a race. And we brought our punts in. We raced them in St. John's Harbor. Our men beat their men. Our women beat their men. <laughs> so, and uh, the thing about this photograph that always amazes me is when Fogo Islanders look at this, they look right past the whale and they go, oh, look, what a good picture of round head. Because, <laughs> because round head is such an important headland for navigation. If you're coming in from the north where all the fish are, that's what you look for first. And we have a geologist in residence program now because, of course, the rocks know everything. And we're just trying to figure out what the rocks know and art programs. And I'm just going to come back to the chair and I'm going to wrap up. This is another thing from my neighbor. He says, you know, you can expect a lot from a chair. You just have to ask it. And obviously, it's a place to sit down. If you do it in the right way, it can hold the meaning that you give it. And you feel the, the, the human touch and the hands and the heart that are in it. I mean, when you think about consumerism, consumerism isn't, isn't about loving things. It's about not loving things. That's why they end up in the landfill. And so I think our relationship with things is a little bit broken. And, and I, of course, I will always contend that our, that our relationships start with our relationship with the natural world. If that one is good and healthy, our other relationships will be much healthier. So this young woman there is from Montreal, Elaine Fortin. She designed that chair, and it was derived pretty much exactly from a punt. So there's the water slide we didn't build. <laughs> and, although we often look at that and go, well, maybe we should have. It would have been a whole lot easier. But, but I, I don't know that much would have been accomplished. Uh, brilliant economist named Tim Jackson. He wrote a book called Prosperity Without Growth, another one that I think is worthy of reading 10 times. Um, I'll read this because it's so important. He says, avoiding the scourge of unemployment may have less to do with chasing after growth and more to do with building an economy of care, craft, and culture. And I will say, if we don't figure this out in rural Canada, the people in this room and other rooms who are working on homelessness and poverty and all these urban issues, you're going to have a whole lot more problems to work on. 
I mean, I think the answer is not send everybody to the city. And this, I think, is the definition of sustainability. And this was written by Domus Magazine. In Newfoundland, such an acceptance of precariousness is a prerequisite for permanence. We need to accept the fact it's precarious, and that will make us a lot more thoughtful. So I don't have the answer about whether it's a requiem or an anthem, but when I go, I'll say I really gave it everything that I know how to, how to give, and uh, I'll keep doing that until, until the big bell rings. We won't go through all these questions. Um, I think we, well, our work is a bit of a model for other rural places, for, for all of these things, for even just the, the business structure, how to use technology, how do we even recognize the most important things that are right in front of us? And um, we'd like to think that we're going to get soon to making kind of a toolkit that would be helpful to other communities that uh, are going through uh, very similar challenges everywhere. But I'm a big fan of community ownership of capital. Why can't communities own things? And there you go. On Fogo Island, we, we don't ever forget that we're, 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 we're not here forever. Leave you with a poem from a, a New Zealand uh, poet and medical doctor, actually. It's a big, long poem. The little section, I'll read it. The art of walking upright is the art of using both feet, one for holding on and one for reaching out. And that's it. Thank you very much.